Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. We are glad each of you are here tonight to join us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. I hope that you have gotten your prayer request uh, sheets from the email, that you've had a chance to go through them and pray and take those requests before the throne of grace. It is a privilege for us as a body, as, us, as a church, for us as born-again believers to be able to take our brothers and sisters before the throne of grace, knowing that their time of need matters to our God, and he has promised grace and mercy, and uh, they will be able to obtain it. And so what a, what a joy to be able to do that. Let me give you a couple of requests that uh, uh, you may not be aware of. One is uh, we, we begin to pray for William Older. And uh, that is Rosemary Stark's dad, and uh, he passed away uh, yesterday early morning. And so we want you to be praying for the Starks family. The funeral is going to be on Friday, and of course, right now it's just really an awkward time. Uh, that nothing we as a church can really do uh, to go and support them. There's no visitation of any sort. But uh, we want to pray for the Starks. We love them, and and certainly know that they're hurting at this time. God gave William 96 years, and so God gave him a long life, and he certainly uh, lived it for the Lord, and we are glad that he is at rest with his Savior in heaven, but we know that there's a void left here for those that are behind. And then let me also have you pray for Harold Hoskins. Harold uh, was taken to the hospital on Monday, and um, he had an infection in his hand uh, and in his fingers. And today they did surgery to remove part of his finger. Uh, as you know, Harold has, has fought these infections off and on, uh, oftentimes putting him in the hospital. And so a uh, very dangerous time for Harold to be in the hospital. So let's be praying for him. Pray for Debbie and Gerald. Uh, as it's a difficult time uh, to have a loved one in the hospital but not really be able to be there. She was waiting to hear how the surgery went because she was not able to be at the hospital with him today. So pray for uh, Debbie and Gerald uh, as they uh, minister to Harold, and I'm sure he'll be in the hospital for a little bit of time, but let's pray for him. And then uh, pray that God would give us wisdom as we begin to... Uh, brainstorm how we can get church back to normal and I look forward to how uh, that's going to happen. I believe that God is orchestrating things in our nation in a way where people are going back to work and uh, things are beginning to open up, at least in some states. And I do believe that uh, God has uh, a very clear purpose in everything that he's doing. And he calls upon us to participate in that purpose, and we're glad to be able to do that and count it a privilege to do that. But let's be found faithful, uh, sharing the gospel, declaring the wonderful truths of God, helping people as they view our life to come to a right conclusion about who God is and what God is like. And so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll be in the book of Nahum. And uh, Nahum uh, is the rest of the story to Jonah, and uh, we've been studying. Uh, so what happened after the revival of Jonah a hundred years later as we look at Nineveh back to her evil ways, and God has had enough, and uh, he is going to destroy Nineveh. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, Thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. It reminds us in this book that you are holy, that you are just, that you are righteous, that you are pure. And so many times we think of the attributes that show mercy and grace and goodness. Lord, we oftentimes uh, forget that uh, you are oftentimes uh, just as prevalent and, and uh, involved in the affairs of life uh, according to your justice and your holiness. Help us to respect you. Help us to give you your rightful place, uh, not only in our lives as you are our authority, but Lord, as we look into your word and we see exactly your plan and purpose, 
the things that we as your children are to do, the things that we are not to do. I pray that we would allow you to uh, be our authority and that we would submit ourselves to that authority and to glorify you with our lives. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that may be watching uh, this sermon and they've never trusted you as their personal Savior. Maybe they've heard about you. Maybe they're wondering about you. Maybe they are looking for you and searching for answers to life and solutions to their sin problem. And Lord, I pray that they would realize that the only solution is found in Jesus Christ, that your justice and your wrath demanded that sin be paid for. And that if those in this life choose to uh, ignore or to refuse your gift of salvation, then they themselves will have to endure the indignation, the justice and the wrath of God upon sin. That they dying in sin would be eternally separated from you and all that is righteous. In a place called hell where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, there is pain and torture Lord, we realize that these are the things that sin brings. We're thankful that our Savior was willing to endure the wrath and punishment of our sin, that we might stand righteous in your, in your presence, poised for an eternity in heaven because of your grace, because of the salvation brought about by Jesus Christ and his willingness to go to the cross of Calvary. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would uh, see uh, an accurate and an appropriate view of your wrath against sin today, and we do pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I said at the beginning of this study, this isn't one of those studies that really uh, brings about a warm and fuzzy feeling. This isn't a book of the Bible uh, that gives you that uh, warm and excited feeling about uh, the Christian life or even about life in general. It certainly ought to produce a rebuke about sin. It ought to help us to see God's view of sin and the fact that he requires a clear punishment for sin. And uh, when you reject the very uh, grace of God and that which would forgive us of sin, namely the person of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary, when we refuse what God would accept as payment for sin to endure the punishment ourselves, the Bible teaches very clearly that it is an eternal separation from God and it is an eternal uh, reality in a place the Bible calls hell or the lake of fire. Some people in our day today would say, uh, I don't like it when people talk about hell. Well, quite frankly, I don't think anyone should like to talk about hell. But the reality is, is the Bible says more about hell than it does heaven. And the reason why it does is because it is warning people that that is the reality for those who reject salvation, who reject what Jesus Christ offers in his gift in order to pay for sin themselves. And the Bible says that nothing that will defile it shall enter heaven. Therefore, God is bound by his own nature to never allow sin into heaven. Therefore, the only way that people can go to heaven is to be declared perfect. And that is the wonderful gospel. That is the wonderful plan of salvation. And that is when I realize what Jesus Christ did for me and that he paid it in full and he offers to me, he extends an opportunity for me to receive by faith a gift the gift is forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven. And when I receive that, I get all of the righteousness of Christ and he takes all of my filth and guilt and sin upon himself. He takes my guilt and gives to me his righteousness. And so I stand before God tonight, not because I'm better than anyone else, but I stand before God tonight perfect in clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, 
who gave me his righteousness when I trusted him as my personal savior. You see, the book of Nahum is really a book that reminds us of God's justice. It reminds us that God's wrath is going to be apparent upon sin. So in chapter one, we looked at the verdict as God looks at Nineveh and he has been patient with Nineveh. He certainly has sent prophets to confront Nineveh, but she would not have it. For a hundred years, she has done her own thing, going in and, and uh, violently taking over cities, ruthlessly treating the people that they capture and destroyed, plundering the cities for their own selfish gain, and God said, enough. And the verdict is, I am going to destroy you. In chapter two, we find exactly how that is going to be played out in God's vengeance. In other words, God is going to pour out his wrath upon the sin that the Ninevites were guilty of. But when we get to chapter three, we find the vindication, and that is basically God simply saying to Israel, I will fight your battles. I am, uh, I am reminded that Jesus Christ was willing to fight the battle of sin and guilt, and he defeated it at Calvary. He was victorious over the penalty of sin. He was victorious over death. He was victorious over the grave and because he fought in my place, he stood in my place, he was indeed the propitiation for my sin. So when we come to chapter three, he's really going to unfold for the Israelites and said, I understand that you have been plundered. I understand that you have been abused. He's looking at the myriad uh, of casualties that uh, laid in the wake of the Ninevites as they violently destroyed people. And God said, I will vindicate you. <clears throat> and so in verse number one of chapter three, Nahum writes, woe to the bloody city. That word woe is the Hebrew word hoy, and it gives us the idea uh, that uh, God is saying, I need your attention. You better sit up and listen, is what God is saying through this word. This word is found 51 times in the Old Testament, 50 times in the major and minor prophets. And God is simply, through these prophets, reminding various people that they better sit up and listen. I cannot help but believe that as the coronavirus has spread itself throughout this world, that God is saying, woe to the world. You better sit up and listen. You better take note. You can ignore me. You can pretend like I didn't create the world. You can pretend like you're not going to give an answer to me, but woe. You better sit up and listen. And that's ultimately what he is saying. Woe to the bloody city. I recognize you. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. He is going to, in these first few verses, describe for us why he is going to pour his wrath out on the Ninevites. And he simply says, because you're a bloody city, because you woo people out with your lies and your false promises, you, you lure them into a trusting you only so that you can destroy them, and you uh, plunder them and uh, abuse them for your own pleasures and take uh, what is rightfully theirs for yourself out of sheer selfishness and use them as a prey. And God is saying, Nineveh, I've had enough. Verse number two, the noise of a whip, the noise of a rattling of the wheels, the idea of the chariots and the prancing horses and the jumping chariots. The horseman lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpse. They stumble upon their corpse. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms, 
and the families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover the skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous? No. That, that was situate amongst the rivers that had waters round about it, whose rampant was the sea and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength and it was infinite. Put in limbo, uh, Lubim were thy helpers. Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Thou art, thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou shalt, uh, they, thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first strips figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, Thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee waters from the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. This is where he's taunting them. Uh, get ready, get ready. Make sure you have lots of water because I'm not going to let you get out for any others. Make sure you fortify your, your strongholds. Uh, go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make, make strong thy, thy brickland. They, they shall, uh, there shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like a canker worm. Make thyself many as a canker word. Make thyself many as a locust. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crown are the locusts and thy captains as the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges of cold day. But when the sun ariseth, the, uh, they shall flee away and their place is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered amongst the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Here's the final delight of Israel. There is no healing of thy bruise. Uh, of thy, bruise. thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? God says in verse number 19, your day of reckoning has come. And people will applaud at the fact that you no longer exist and never will. And God is going to give his vindication in this wonderful last chapter. A, a, a terrible display, if you will, of God's anger out on sin. I want you to see three or four things tonight from this text. Number one, the details of Nineveh's fall. I mentioned some of these earlier in the first four verses, but God is going to say, this is the reason why I am destroying you. He says the sins of the violent nature. In other words, uh, the Ninevites were known uh, for their incredible violence. They would use uh, the violence of a pre preceding capture in order to tell the story to the upcoming uh, city of what they could expect and that there was nothing they could stop. They would explain uh, how they would uh, oftentimes uh, dig holes and then uh, bury people up to their necks so that then they could just come through and behead them. And I'm not trying to be gross, I'm trying to help you to understand these were violent people. And they were not just uh, satisfied to be violent, but then to intimidate the next group, telling them stories about what they had done and say, we're going to do the same to you, and you can't stop us. They were of a violent nature. But then the second thing is, is there were sins of a vile nature. 
he began to, to unfold their selfishness. He says they had an insatiable desire for power. I'm going to read all four of these because I think I'm going to make an application that we might all be able to understand. They had an insatiable desire for power. They had an insincere deception of promises. In other words, they would bait people out uh, by promising them something just to destroy them. They would promise if they would relinquish something that then they would show mercy or they would show restraint or they would uh, show patience, but only to uh, deceive them and to destroy them in the process. They had an insincere deception of promises. They had an incredible delight of plunder or for plunder. They could never get enough. No matter how many cities they conquered, no matter how many people they destroyed, they just had to heap more and more for themselves and the independent demand for the pagan. In other words, they They had no regard for God. They had no fear of God. They had no respect for God. But rather, they lived their life in in paganism. Well, when I look at America, when I look at our political scheme, when I look at a lot of what we're facing today, I say, whoa, America. Do we really think we're an exception? And that God will not give America and treat America the same way he did Nineveh. Because I look at those first four verses, specifically the first verse is where he really unfolds these these points that I'm making here. And they had this insatiable desire for power. Sounds like politicians today. They, they, they just want more power. We're finding right now uh, that uh, they're using fear in order to control people, in order to expand their power. And, and we, we have that that we have to navigate through. In light of a real crisis, we have to navigate a, a selfish agenda. Why? Because there's an insatiable desire for power. I listen to some of these politicians and they, and they don't make any sense in common sense and it certainly doesn't make good sense for America, but it just reeks with the desire to gain more and more power, to be able to stay in Washington longer and longer and longer, to get reelected over and over again. And they don't even know what it is like to live in the actual world they create because they make all of these exceptions for them in all of their power. There's an insatiable desire for power, but there's an insincere deception of promises. Listen, we have all kinds of promises being made today. They'll say whatever they have to say in order for people to elect them to offer. They'll say whatever they have to say in order uh, to get in a position where they can control money, where they can control events, where they can control laws. I can't even imagine why there is a problem with closing the border when we are all to stay at home, but people are supposed to come from across the border and take our jobs and live off of our land and live off of our money while we're at home and not able to go to work. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Who does this make sense to? We're supposed to stay home, but they don't have to stay home. And yet we have all of this stuff going on. It's a insincere deception of promises and then an incredible delight of plunder. We live in a world today where people cannot get enough. They just want more and more and more. And then the independent demand for the pagan. We live in a secular humanistic world that lives and operates. Sounds like Washington, D.C. lives and operates as if God doesn't have an outline for government. That he doesn't have an outline for proper worship. That he doesn't have an outline and an expectation for people. When I stop and I look at what God lays out for Nineveh and he says, whoa. I'm going to destroy you. I can't help but look at it and go, America, you better wake up. We better pray for our politicians. We better pray for our election. We better pray that America comes back to God because what God does to Nineveh, I would not want to see God do to America. 
what he is going to uh, show us, uh, his wrath being poured out on this type of behavior, and it's the same type of behavior we're seeing in America, minus the violence. But you give in to this other long enough, you'll see the violence. That's the way it goes. So the details of Nineveh's fall are in verses one through three. The second thing is the disgrace of Nineveh's fall. In verses five through seven, he begins to, uh, uh, to expose Nineveh for who they really are. He uses some very uh, explicit language as he talks about how a, uh, how a harlot would expose herself uh, to the sin of the individual who had hired her and all of, of her... Uh, uh, being would be exposed. He is saying, I am going to do the same thing to Nineveh. I am not going to leave anything uh, to imagination. I am going to expose them for who they really are. I'm going to expose them for what they've really done. I'm going to expose them for what they've really uh, accomplished and how they have accomplished it why they have become so powerful in the world. I'm going to expose the disgrace of Nineveh. And so God uh, exposes Nineveh's sin. He begins to be very explicit into some of the things that they had done. And then he says, I'm going, I'm going to expel Nineveh's stench. In other words, I want you to know that I am actually so sick of them that I am going to completely annihilate them. I am going to get rid of every fiber of them. I don't know about you, but when I see this side of God, I tremble. And then in appreciation and in a heart of gratitude, I thank God for my Savior, Jesus Christ, who was willing to endure that side of God so that I could stand righteous in his sight. You see, it is a crazy, uh, terrible, um, incredibly um, powerful display of God's hatred towards sin. The Bible teaches, teaches us that God is angry with the wicked every day. God has no tolerance for wickedness. God has no tolerance for sin. And yet we live in a day today where we feel like God is okay with some things that God understands, that God will wink, God will turn a blind eye, a deaf ear. And let me tell you, God hates sin. He is patient. He will be long-suffering. He is gracious, he is always good, and he is merciful. But I'm going to tell you, when you see God's wrath and when you see God's justice, you will realize that you are not going to stop God in his power when he demonstrates this. And he uh, tells Nineveh that he would expel them, uh, expel their very stench to his nostrils. And then God would expedite Nineveh's slaughter. I don't know exactly how God deals with sinners today. I know that he was patient with me. He continues to be patient with me. But I don't know exactly. I have opinions about the sin unto death. I have opinions about God calls and God calls and God calls. And is there a time when God simply says, okay, no more calling? I'm just done. I don't know. But I do know this, that the day comes and there is a line in which God says no more. I do know that there is a day coming when he's going to return. He's going to take all of his children out of this, this world. We call it the rapture. It may be tonight. It may be very close. We realize that he's going to take us out. He's going to pour his wrath out on this world, ultimately destroying it with fire under fervent heat. We know that that's the facts. We know that in the process of that, he is going to destroy up to a third of the world at a time through various means. He is going to pour his, life, his wrath out uh, on every life in this, on this earth through tribulation. We do know that that is a reality. Scripture tells us so. And I don't know how he treats the person who is shaking their fist at God tonight saying, I 
don't believe you exist. I'm going to live my own way. I've got life under control. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the church believes. I don't care. I'm going to do my own thing. Can I tell you I'm thankful that God is patient and gracious and long-suffering, but I don't know at what point does he get here. And he says, okay, believe what you want, live how you want, but the day's coming you're going to experience this side of me. I don't want to, that's why I sent my son. I didn't want to, that's why I offered salvation. I don't want to, that's why I have heaven as an option, but I'll let you choose. And then when people get to a point where God lets them go, Romans 1 tells us that he hands them over to a reprobate mind. When does that happen? I don't know. Does that happen today? Probably. But we know that when somebody gets to this point in their life where they realize that God is going to pour out his wrath on sin, this would be a terrible place for anyone to be. And he is laying out for us in the book of Nahum. In verses five through seven, it says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. He is making it very clear that that I am going to expose your sin, I'm going to expel your stench, and I am I am going to uh, give your slaughter. I'm going to expedite your slaughter. What a terrible place for anyone to be. And then the third thing in verses 14 to 18, the demand of Nineveh's fall, we find that in verse number 14, draw thee waters for the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar, make strong thy bricks. You know, he is saying, listen, uh, Nineveh, get ready. You say, well, God is taunting them. He is. God is helping them to see exactly what they used to do to everyone else. You know, my Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, there is a principle called sowing and reaping. It's a universal principle. It's a positive principle as well as a negative principle, but it ultimately says what goes around comes around. And God says you can, you can enjoy your sin for a while, but there's a payday someday. And some of the very things that you did to others will come back, and, and, and that is exactly what you are going to reap because it's exactly what you sowed. Sometimes we think we're getting away with it because of the fact that we don't reap right away because we reap later than we sow. But maybe the most difficult part of that principle is that we reap more than we sow. Certainly God was capable of handling, handing more over against the Ninevites than they were ever able to create in their intimidation of others. But God simply says, get ready. Nineveh, make sure that you got enough water. Get ready to, to, to uh, man the, 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 the walls, fortify them, make sure you're ready to go because I'm coming for you. And by the way, nobody's been able to stop me and you won't be able to stop me either. And oh, and by the way, make sure you get a bunch of bricks so that when the wall breaks down, you can begin to build it back up because you're not gonna want somebody to get through the bricks, the walls. He's, he's unfolding this, this dynamic where he is taunting them as they would do in their violence before taking over a city. And God simply says, just remember sowing and reaping. And so God reminds them of their fate. I'm going to destroy you. God reminds them to be ready to fight. He's like, listen, I want you to know that that." It, you can fight, you're not going to win. You can give it your best, but you're not going to defeat me. You can say that you're going to be the mighty uh, nation in the world, that you're going to go out as other times. You're going to be a super world power. You can say whatever you want, Nineveh. But as you fight, remember, you're going to lose. It's exactly what Nineveh would do to others. He would, they would encourage them to get all their soldiers together 
to get their best uh, fighters in place because when they came, they were going to go right through them and ultimately slaughter them. And that's what God is saying. And then he reminds them to do their best to get fortified. I don't think God is going to do this with lost people at the great white throne judgment because God is still love and grace and mercy and I believe his heart will be broke. But I wonder at the great white throne judgment if he doesn't just ask some questions. Like, you thought you could run your own life. You made it clear you didn't need me. You made fun of the Bible like a crutch for some people that you didn't need it. That you would be fine without God. You would be fine without all those commandments and principles to guide your life. That, that you didn't need an authority in your life. That you didn't need a savior for your sin. And you didn't need anyone to try to control your life. Is that right? Now, you say God's not going to do that. I don't think God will do that. I don't think God will have to do that. I think individuals that stand at the great white throne judgment with their knees bowed and they recognize and claim he is God. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what they'll say. And then they'll say, I was such a fool. I thought I could fight my own fights. I thought I could, I could make it to heaven on my own. I thought I could avoid hell on my own. I thought I could control my own life. I thought I was in, uh, in uh, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Not uh, uh, infallible. I thought that I would never be able to be defeated. But then they're going to realize this was their decision. That they had chose to reject God's love gift of salvation that they had literally chose to endure the wrath of God upon them, that this was their doing. I think ultimately that God is proving that to Nineveh. Remember how arrogant you were as you came into those cities and ultimately destroyed them? Do you know how it felt? You thought you were in control and now you have no control. Nineveh, falls. Nineveh is destroyed. And today, Nineveh isn't even talked about, just like God said. Oh, a superpower in their day, but nothing today. I think of some of these multi-billionaires that don't think they need God today. When they get to hell, they're going to realize they thought they had it all. They didn't think they needed anything and they will realize they've lost it all, never to be able to be recovered, never to be able to experience heaven, never to be able to experience God's grace, never to be able to experience God's mercy, to never be able to have faith. You see, all of that ends when God destroys, when there is an eternal judgment in hell. God teaches us that there is a payment someday. And for those who seem like they're getting away with with laughing in God's face and living contrary to his purposes, God says, you know, I love them and I'd like to see them change, but it's their decision. But at some point, if they don't accept my grace, they will experience my wrath and justice. It leads us to verse number 19, which is the delight over Nineveh's fall. Now, I don't believe that anybody is ever going to celebrate anyone ever going to hell. I certainly am not. My heart broke when I watched Saddam Hussein and they were walking him up to to the place where he was going to be hung. And the, the camera zeroed in on the fact that he was clutching a Koran Bible. And I thought to myself in a few minutes, it's not that he's just going to die from this life but probably be cast for an eternity in the lake of fire. I didn't say good, he had it coming. My heart broke. You see, it's a reality. However, verse 19 
tends to give us the impression that the nations around, because that formidable foe, that, uh, that, that uh, violent and vile nation that everyone feared was now being dealt with and taken out of the way. And that was Nineveh. So the delight was over Nineveh's fall. It's interesting, though, that I, I look at verse 19 a little bit different. And I think of the fact that, yeah, sin was my enemy. Sin was the thing that was going to destroy my life. It was the most intimidating thing. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't be victorious over it on my own. I, I couldn't solve its, its uh, sentence against me. I, I, I was helplessly in bondage to sin, and its goal was to destroy me and forever separate me from God. But Jesus Christ came in, and he, and he conquered sin. He came in, and he, he did away with the penalty of my sin. He paid it in full. He solved my problem. He offered me a gift, and I can delight in my Savior, Jesus Christ. I can't help but think, as, as people were celebrating God and, and his deliverance, that we as Christians ought not take some time and celebrate our Savior and the deliverance we've had from sin. You see, when you read the book of Nahum, you hear of God's justice against Nineveh. But when you read the book of Nahum, we ought to remember that God has delivered us from the penalty and the judgment against our sin and robed us in his righteousness and forgiven us our sin and made us fit for heaven forever to be with him. The book of Nahum concludes with a theological note for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually. The effect of Assyria's sin was as universal as her empire. Now God has answered as widespread as her evil and wickedness had been, so would be the news of God's judgment upon Nineveh. And I think about that and I think to myself, I have the awesome responsibility. As vast and worldwide as the penalty of sin, the strength of sin, the sentence of sin has been, so has been the victory of our Savior over sin. And I should be telling it everywhere I go. I should be telling people that there is victory in Jesus. I trust that you'll take opportunity to do that today. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for the reminder of your judgment against sin. Thank you for the reminder of victory over sin. Thank you for reminding us that you are a just God and a holy God, but you're a gracious and merciful God. You're a God of love. And God, I pray that you would help us to be able to share this incredible story. The world is becoming more defiant. The world is becoming more independent. The world is becoming more wicked. They're becoming more arrogant in their positions against God and becoming more arrogant in their, in their disobedience to your word. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be faithful, to teach them about Jesus, to warn them that they can go down this path but when they meet your justice, it is not very pretty. It is terrible and it is eternal. I pray that you'd help us to take the good news of the glorious gospel everywhere we go. May we never get over it personally. May we thank you for our salvation every day and the willingness of our Savior Jesus to pay our sin debt and to give to us a righteous standing before God. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege to have a church like Faith Baptist Church. I pray that you'd help us to be able to send the gospel, the good news of the gospel all over the world, that we would be faithful in our own Jerusalems, but that we would be faithful to take it to the uttermost part of the world, that the world may know that there is a Savior, his name is Jesus, that there's an answer to the sentence of sin, and his name is Jesus, that there can be victory in Jesus. Thank you for the victory we experience. Thank you for our position in Christ. 
I pray that you would bless our church, protect our church, help us to fulfill your purposes, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. I trust that you'll meet me again tomorrow morning uh, at 9 o'clock for Daily Focus, and uh, then we'll see you again on Sunday. Uh, we only got a few more weeks, and uh, you should have gotten the letter today. Uh, we're going to launch one service uh, on uh, May 17th, and uh, we'll take some things. We'll be giving you a rollout exactly what that's going to look like, how it's going to be practiced, how we're going to evaluate, how we're going to continue to unfold from that point. And, and I appreciate you praying for, for me to have wisdom. Pray for our deacons meeting tonight as we unfold some of the details and uh, get ready to go forward. I look forward to Faith Baptist Church being back to full steam in a normal capacity uh, where we can interact on a regular basis. I miss you and I love you. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.